Welcome back, everyone. This is Dave from Corn Productions here to talk about Star Trek Season 1, Episode 3, titled Charlie X. The episode's description reads as follows. Captain Kirk must learn the limits to the power of a 17-year-old boy with psionic ability to create anything and destroy anyone. The episode was written by D.C. Fontana. Uh, according to the Internet Movie Database, she was advised by Gene Roddenberry to use her initials D.C. on her initial scripts for Star Trek. Instead of her first name, Dorothy, because at the time, networks were often biased against female writers. She ended up becoming one of the show's most prolific writers with 11 episodes to her name, as well as contributing to several Star Trek spin-off series, including the animated series, TNG, and Deep Space Nine. She wrote episodes of Babylon 5 and Logan's Run. She died on December 2nd, 2019 at the age of 80. The episode was directed by Lawrence Dobkin, 84 directorial stints, this is his only work on this series. In addition, he has 220 acting credits, including a fourth season TNG episode as an ambassador in the episode Mind's Eye. The series was created by Gene Roddenberry and aired from 1966 to 1969. It was nearly canceled in its second season, but a fan writing campaign brought it back for a third season. But NBC did what NBC does. It killed the series by slashing its budget and changing time slots to a less favorable time slot. Roddenberry was significantly less involved in the third season of the show because he probably saw the writing, the handwriting on the wall. The episode originally aired on September 15th, 1966. Before going any, any further, I'll tell you a couple of things. One, this is not a square free podcast. If you haven't watched the episode, I highly recommend you go and check it out and then come back and give me a listen. Secondly, if you're listening on the platforms of this podcast now available on, please follow and feel free to check out my YouTube channel, Corn Productions, where additional content can be discovered. If you're already on my YouTube channel, please like, share, and comment, and subscribe to my channel. Alright, so eagle-eyed viewers of mine might notice I don't do too many Star Trek-related videos, despite at one time being a rabid fan of the many series. I've covered a little bit of Star Trek Picard, have at least one video covering Discovery, and did a Star Trek Deep Space Nine video, Far Beyond the Stars, for Black History Month. Other than that, I haven't really talked about it very much. I don't really feel like I could say much that hasn't been said a thousand times before in a thousand different podcasts. And really the idea of doing a podcast on Star Trek with its over 700 episodes of produced television feels daunting to me, and that's not even including the movies. So that being said, why am I doing this original series episode? Well... It's because I watched this episode recently, and I kind of felt like it. I could hear the commentary voice in my head going, so I decided, why not? Uh, this episode on Internet Movie Database is listed third. In reality, it was the second to air and the tenth produced. Gene Roddenberry, the creator, produced the pilot titled The Cage. The network hated it, so a second pilot was commissioned and titled No Man Has Gone Before. A lot of the cast was changed over. Jeffrey Hunter, who played Captain Pike, would become Captain Kirk, played by William Shatner. The first episode to air was The Man Trap. The second pilot episode would air after this episode. The Cage's footage would be used in a two-parter later in the season, and the original pilot itself wouldn't be available or aired for many, many years after this fact. I do find it odd that they chose to air this episode, where no man has gone before right after it, because they deal with similar subject matter, uh, basically someone who has mind-controlling abilities. It didn't seem like a particularly good idea to air these episodes back-to-back. -back. I don't have many memories of the original series. I grew up with TNG, the original series movies, and of course was a fan of all the series post-TNG, Deep Space Nine, I'm almost as tempted to say was my actual favorite, though TNG owns a special place in my heart. I, I honestly don't even remember if I actually watched all the original series episodes, ever. Uh, I don't have any memories of them, really. Though I've certainly watched a few in my time. As far as this episode, it's entertaining. Not the best in the world, but it's funny watching Kirk try to be a father figure to a young Charlie. He's not any better at it than Picard was in TNG. It's kind of hard for me to judge this episode by modern standards because, you know, everything is different from when it was back then. Uh, from themes to culturally to special effects, pacing, so on and so forth. The television landscape is just very different nowadays, and from the one that I eventually would grow up with. Alright, so getting into the scene by scene, the Enterprise is meeting up with the USS Interis and coming on board, according to Cap Captain Kirk's log, 
is an unusual passenger. Being on board is Captain Rampart, played by Charles Stewart. He has 28 credits, including an episode of The Fugitive, two episodes of Batman, and his last credit was the movie Armageddon. He died on October 17, 2016, at the age of 93. And most of the cast and crew of this episode are deceased. Because, you know, this episode is like... Because this is like a, a 58-year-old television show. Rampart introduces his navigator. He's played by Don Eitner. He died on March 9th, 2018. He has 75 credits, including two episodes of Mission Impossible, one episode of Lassie, and five episodes of Dynasty. Crazily enough, when I was looking into this episode, I discovered that Lassie had 591 episodes. That's kind of absurd. But anyway, the titular character of the episode, Charlie X, he's played by Robert Walker Jr. He has 80 credits for him, including an episode of Columbo, Murder, She Wrote, and a Jack Nicholson movie, Easy Rider, directed by and co-starred in with the late Dennis Hopper. He died on December 5th, 2019 at the age of 79. And of course, Kirk is played by William Shatner. I, I almost feel like uh, I don't really need to go through his credits because he's quite famous, but I'm going to do so anyway. He has 250 acting credits, including four episodes of Haven, which is a show I see a lot in credits of people I talk about, uh, most, mostly the Nova Scotia set of actors that appear in some of the things I've talked about. An episode of Sequest DSB, a regular on Boston Legal, and tons and tons of Star Trek projects, including a couple of documentaries. He also has producer and writing credits as well as directorial stints. He directed the infamous Star Trek V The Final Frontier. Shatner has quite the reputation of having a bit of an ego, a bit of a screen hog, especially in his early days, and his acting delivery was quite frequently spooked over the years. He feuded with most of the original cast and still feuds with George Takei as Sulu, who isn't in this episode, nor is Scotty, I don't, I don't believe anyway, played by James Duhon. Uh, he would also feud with him quite hard. I guess at some point I'm going to have to do another episode of the original series to, uh, that includes those two actors. Fun fact, I saw James Duhon at a convention once, the only convention I was ever at, and my Uncle Arnold actually met James Duhon at one point. Charlie was left on a planet by himself for a long time without any human contact, and it looks for a moment like Rampart is going to say some negative things about Charlie, but Charlie is very obviously shown to use his PSI powers to make him say only good things. Charlie interrupts the conversation multiple times to ask questions about the ship, until he's gently called out about it by Captain Kirk himself. He says, interrupting is wrong. I would say the more accurate term would be rude, but uh, I suppose wrong is a good term as any. Rampart and his navigator beam off the ship. They might as well be uh, whistling and sneaking away like they are getting away with something, only they aren't going to be getting away with anything, as we shall see. Yeoman Rand enters to escort Charlie around. Rand was played by Grace Lee Whitney. She was only in eight episodes of the original series. There is conflicting reports on why that is the case, but it's said that they wanted Kirk to have more romances, so they removed her from the show. There are claims by Whitney that there was some harassment on the set by a studio executive, and she also had problems with drugs and alcohol after she left the show. She did have 72 acting credits. She was in four out of the six original uh, series movies, and had an appearance on Star Trek Voyager titled Flashback in the third season of that show. Besides that, she was involved in a ton of Star Trek projects, and she died on May 1st, 2015 at the age of 85. Charlie is confused by Rand and asks Kirk if she is a girl. Kirk says yes, with a smirk on his face. Little does he know that this is going to end up being the bane of his existence in this episode. And we have our credits. When we come back from the credits, we get the star date in the captain's log as... 1553.7. He's once again telling us about the unusual passenger he took on, which is not new information, uh, but he was the lone survivor of a transport crash 14 years ago when he was 3 years old, making him 17. Charlie is in sick bay with Dr. Brunkoy doing tests while laying on a bed upside down. I have no idea what he was doing here, but it, it, apparently it was very futuristic. McCoy is played by DeForest Kelly. He has 134 credits. Before Star Trek, he was in a ton of westerns. He appeared in all six original series movies, guest starred in the first episode of TNG, and did some of the video games. He died on June 11th, 1999, at the age of 79. 
His last credit is in the animated film, The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars, and that's a very interesting last credit. McCoy was one of the three main stars of the series, up there with Kirk, and to my knowledge, was one of the few people to actually get along with William Shatner. McCoy is trying to get the details on how he managed to survive. Charlie asks his doctor if he likes him as he's about to leave, and McCoy is a little stunned by the question, but says, why not? Charlie says the other ship didn't like him. He tried. He really tried. He just wants to be liked. And McCoy says most 17-year-olds do. He leaves sickbay and watches one guy work really closely who smiles at him. And I would honestly be very uncomfortable with this. He watches another who has more of a me reaction in that he kind of shakes his head at him as Charlie leaves. Charlie follows Rand and gives her a present. She's surprised that it that it's actually her favorite and that it's not in the ship's stores. She has to go but offers to meet up later with him and he slaps her butt as he goes. He calls him, she calls him out on that but and says, you don't do that. But Charlie doesn't know why. Rand tells him to tell Kirk and McCoy what he did and one of them will explain it to him. I bet Kirk can't wait to thank her for this. On the bridge, McCoy talks to Spock wondering why he would lie about there being Thasians on the planet as there, it is rumored to be, and um, to my knowledge, this is, this is the first time we were actually hearing about this conversation. This is the first time we're hearing about the Thasians, and it's kind of a weird drop-in. I don't quite understand why it wasn't mentioned earlier. Spock is played by Leonard Nimoy, whose popularity on the show threatened to eclipse Shatner's, causing some friction between the two of them. But after the original series, the two had a decent relationship, though there are some whispers that Nimoy wasn't talking to him in the last years of his life. He has 142 acting credits, he was in the animated series, all six movies, a TNG two-parter, and he reprised the role of Spock for the rebooted Star Trek movies, as well as appearing in Star Trek Into Darkness, which was the second movie in that rebooted series. He was a villain on Fringe, did a lot of voice work because he, was a fan he had a fantastic voice. He also has producer credits along with 13 directorial credits, which includes directing Star Trek 3 and 4. And he also directed Three Men and a Little Baby. He died on February 27, 2015, two days after my birthday. Nichelle Nichols, as a horror, is also on the bridge. She has 69 credits for her. She did voice work on Spider-Man, the animated series, as well as Batman, the animated series, and also on Scooby-Doo. She appeared in some of the fan content as well. And of course, the movies and the animated series and all that. Kirk wants to pass his responsibilities for Charlie off to the doctor, teaching him about adolescence. But McCoy and Spock both believe that, he, that Charlie needs a strong father figure type. And on top of that, he already looks up to the captain. Hence, they try to pass the hot potato back to him, but Kirk is having none of it. It's still McCoy's job. Spock brings up the Thazian conversation again, that the myth must be true for the boy to have survived. In the rec room, Rand is there hanging out with Ahura and Spock. Charlie eventually comes to hang out. Spock plays instrumental on an instrument as Ahura makes up a song about being on the Enterprise. Charlie is initially enjoying the song until Till Charlie becomes a part of the song. And then Charlie makes it so that she can't sing at all, which is honestly never even addressed. She just can't sing anymore. The scene moves on. And in the next scene, Ahura's talking again like nothing happened. Charlie impresses Rand with some card tricks. And then Charlie finds Kirk and asks the question of why you shouldn't smack a woman on the butt. And Kirk is so bad at answering this question. It's, kind of, it's pretty hilarious. I'm glad I don't need him to teach me why I shouldn't do this because I would be pretty confused if he did. And I'm not saying that I would do any better trying to explain it either. He's saved by the bell when Ahura pages him to go to the bridge and Charlie goes with him. Rampart of Interis is trying to talk to Kirk. But they lose the ability to communicate. Uh, it was likely that they were going to warn Kirk about Charlie. Charlie suggests the communication wasn't well constructed, which draws a suspicious look from Kirk. And they soon find debris that used to be the Antares. The cook calls to tell Kirk that there are real turkeys live in the oven. Kirk seems to be about to ask if he's having a stroke. And we hear a muffled laugh from Charlie, who departs the bridge. Hey, there's nothing suspicious going on here. Kirk and Spock play 3D chess. He's not doing very well. Kirk is distracted by the loss of Interis. Spock thinks there's a more immediate problem, which is Charlie, 
And this confuses Kirk. I don't know how. I don't know how he's not catching on to the fact that there's something going on with him. I mean, it's pretty obvious to me. Charlie enters just in time to watch Kirk somehow win the game, and that's despite Spock saying his game is illogical. Kirk leaves, Charlie and Spock play, and the game does not last long. Spock handily beats him, and he reveals himself to be a sore loser after Spock leaves as he melts the chess pieces. Uh, hey Charlie, they weren't at fault for you losing. Just saying. He runs into Ran, who's trying to hook him up with a pretty and much younger yeoman. Uh, this would be Yeoman Tina. She's played by Pat McNulty. She only has 10 acting credits. Nothing since 1995. She has an editing, editing assistant, and additional crew credit in the early 2000s. She died on September 4th, 2023 at the age of 80. And that is pretty recent. Charlie is dismissive of her, wanting to talk to Rand alone. And Tina takes a hint saying she'll go somewhere where she's actually wanted. Uh, hey, uh, Tina, you can come here. Rand gives Charlie hell, saying that that was very rude, but Charlie only has eyes for Rand. Are you sure, Charlie? Because Tina was quite cute. He gives an odd compliment, saying that Rand smells like a girl. Uh, Kirk, can you, like, teach this guy some something? Like, give him some riz or something? I mean, I can't do it, because I don't have any myself. But still, you have plenty of it, so you can help him out. Rand is finally clued into the depth of Charlie's little crush. Rand goes to Kirk. Kirk says he's already talked to him about the swatting thing. And, and that line made me laugh. Like, yeah, you, you did a great job there. Uh, bang up job, really. Rand says if something isn't done, sooner or later, she's going to have to hurt him. And when I initially heard that line, I thought she meant she was going to have to physically hurt him because he was annoying her. But it's more along the lines of emotionally hurt him but when, he, when she ends up rejecting him. Rand goes on, goes on and on about this. And then Kirk says he will talk to him. And he has a little smirk on his face. Maybe you should get some advice yourself on what to say so you can do a better job at the fatherly advice thing. To his credit, I think he actually does a pretty good job here. He asks Charlie about the burned chess pieces. He doesn't answer him. Uh, he basically just blows off the question and Kirk doesn't pursue it. Kirk starts to talk to, uh, about Rand, telling him that he can't have Rand. The ages are wrong and learning to live with the things and people you can't have is all part of growing up. Kirk does, does, Kirk does reassure Charlie that there's nothing wrong with him that hasn't been wrong with any teenage boy since the bottle came out. And by the way, this is a really good scene for the two of them. Both, uh, both do a pretty good job acting in the scene. A horror pages him about a course adjustment, and Kirk has Spock handle it. Because he wants to take Charlie to the rec room. He tries to teach him the basics of biting. It doesn't go super well, especially when he makes Sam, who had, was watching, disappear for laughing at him. Sam is played by Bob Haran. 68 acting credits for him, including True Lies, 17 episodes of The Wild Wild West, and The Naked Gun. Uh, this is one of two appearances on this series. The other is as Kalis in the third season episode, The Savage Curtain. He also has 30, 346 stunt credits, which includes two episodes of The X-Files, which is a series I regularly cover now, and the original pilot episode of this series, The Cage. He died on October 10th, 2021 at the age of 97. So Kirk is finally clued into who Charlie is, about time. Charlie didn't mean to do it, he says, but Sam made him do it. Kirk calls up two security guards to combine the quarters. This doesn't seem to go very well as he makes the security guard's weapons disappear. But Kirk eventually plays tough love and gets Charlie to go to his quarters. A horror pages Kirk to let him know that all phasers disappeared. He has Spock and McCoy beat him in the briefing room. Spock is on and on about the Thasians again, suggesting that they had been that they had been known to have the powers that Charlie is exhibiting, so they must still exist. Kirk says he's an adolescent boy who wants, who wants and needs. Nothing happens fast enough for him. Spock says he is likely responsible for the destruction of the Antares, indicating a total disregard for life. Kirk says he doesn't understand what life is. He's just a boy. And sorry, Captain, but he's 17. He should have some understanding of that. His age alone isn't the problem. He was basically alone forever. Uh, and is basically super-powered, and that's not a good combination. Kirk says they can't just go drop him off at the colony because he would cause problems there, that he's trying to be a man with the adolescent in him getting in the way. Spock points out that he also has a weapon in him that could destroy them all. Charlie comes in escorted by security officers, and he's all smiles. Kirk asks him if he's responsible for the Antares, and Charlie admits it because they weren't very nice to him. Kirk asks, well, what about us? And Charlie admits... He doesn't know and leaves. Well, that's pretty ominous. 
On the bridge, Kirk tries to talk to the colony and change course, but Ahura is burned when her, when her control panel is shorted out. And the ship will not change course. Charlie shows up and makes Spock recite poetry. Kirk tells him to leave his crew alone. Charlie backs down, but Spock points out that he won't be able to do that for very much longer. In the corridor, Charlie runs into Tina, who he turns into a lizard, just for asking, what's wrong, Charlie? He goes to Rand's quarters, who's wearing a pink nightgown, and she's not very happy to see him. She turns on the comm to alert Kirk that he's there. Things escalate just as Kirk and Spock show up, and he makes Janice disappear because she wasn't nice at all. The only reason Kirk isn't disappeared is because he's needed to run the ship. Kirk asks about Janice, but he won't answer the question whether she's alive or dead. Charlie, as he leaves, thinks growing up isn't the bee's knees, and hey, I agree. He's not a man, and he can still do everything. Spock sets up a force field and sets up Charlie to be trapped. Uh, this doesn't go very well. They succeed in trapping him in there, but then he just uses his powers to get out. He goes through the ship and makes a woman old for no reason at all. She was just walking by him. I don't know why he did that to her. And he makes someone laughing have no face, which is pretty terrifying. And he ends up shoving three guys out of the way. Well, you should consider yourselves lucky there because it could have been much, much worse. Kirk on the bridge comes up with a solution. Turn on every device to the ship to overwhelm his powers so they can sedate him. McCoy says it's risky and Kirk says he will do away with them anyway, so they have to try. They do not have a choice. Charlie shows up on the bridge, sits in the captain's chair, and they out end up turning on all the devices as Kirk attacks Charlie and he starts to and Charlie ends up starting to make him feel pain, but then suddenly that stops. Suddenly the navigation computer clears so that they can, you know, do something with it again. And Rand reappears on the bridge in her nightgown. A ship appears, and then a floating head appears on the bridge. It's the Thasians coming to get Charlie. And Charlie is freaking at this point. He does not want to go with them. The Thasians explain that they realize Charlie escaped too late. They couldn't bring back the Antares. He's sorry, they're, he is personally sorry about that. But the ship and everyone else is back. Uh, this is He's played by Abraham. So far, he made two appearances in the series. The other in the third season episode, uh, Spectre of a Gun. He has 144 credits for him in total. He died on January 21st, 1988 at the age of 91. Charlie begs him not to be taken, and much to my surprise, Kirk actually speaks up for him, saying he belongs with his own kind. But the Thasian says that Charlie will use the powers he gave to him to destroy them, or, or they will be forced to destroy him. I'm actually kind of curious, they gave him the powers, so is there a reason why they couldn't take the powers away and let Charlie go about his life? I guess the answer is no, but uh, Kirk doesn't even really suggest it. Charlie cries and begs, and eventually he's taken away. Kirk assures Rand that it's okay now, except that she's on the bridge in her nightgown, and that's pretty darn embarrassing, and she looks pretty pretty in that, by the way. And that's where the episode ends. A couple of other casting notes for people I couldn't quite identify, but nevertheless, I thought this would be interesting. There's a Lieutenant Wesley, played by Eddie Paskey, six credits for him, but 60 episodes of this series, uh, some as Leslie and others as different characters. He was in a fan-made series, Star Trek Phase 2, that had some original cast in it, including George Decay for an episode and Grace Lee Whitney. He died on August 17, 2021 at the age of 81. One of the security guards is played by Frank Da Vinci. He was involved in almost all the episodes of the original series, both as an actor and as additional crew. He died on June 4th, 2013. There's an uncredited role for Lieutenant Hadley. He's played by Bill Blackburn. He similar, similarly was involved in almost every episode of the series in some capacity. He was in the movie Spartacus with Kirk Douglas, by the way. And that is all I have for you for this video. I will probably do another original series episode just to include the actors that were not in this episode, specifically the guys who play Sulu and uh, Scotty. Um, but other than that, I mean, I, I'm not gonna, I don't really know what I'm gonna do as, in terms of covering Star Trek. Uh, I will probably do more things here and there, but we shall, we shall certainly see. Uh, that's all I got for you. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video and want to support the channel, there are a number of ways to do so. You can follow me on Twitter at Core Productions. You can join one of my Core Productions Facebook pages. You can buy something from the Core Productions store on Zazzle. You can buy me a copy. 
You can join the Corn Productions membership for 99 cents a month. And of course, you can like, share, and comment on this video as well as subscribing to my channel. This is Dave from Corn Productions, signing off.